Hi everyone, I'm Ernest Baker, Editor-in-Chief at Front Office Sports, and I want to welcome you to Second Acts, a new series where we chat with athletes that are known for their achievements in their respective sports, but are now thriving in their second acts. Joining me today is Olympic gold medalist Sean Johnson East. At 30 years old, she's already accomplished a lifetime of achievements, including Olympic medals, a New York Times best-selling book, several businesses, a career in broadcast, and a mirror ball trophy after winning Dancing with the Stars. After retiring from gymnastics in 2012, Sean made an appearance on several TV shows, including The Apprentice and Adventure Capitalist. Sean married Andrew East, with whom she has documented her life on their shared YouTube channel, which has over 215 million views, and a podcast, which has climbed to number two on the overall charts. So happy to have you here with us today, Sean. How's everything going on your end? Thank you. It's great to be here, and it's it's great over here. It's just mass chaos all the time, I feel like. Why, why the chaos? Uh, because I have two kids under the age of two, and I feel like between me and my husband, we have a million projects, and I, I can never remember all of it. Well, that's what this is all about, second acts, <laughs> and so that's perfect. Uh, we may as well get right into it. Before we talk about those second acts and those million projects that you have going on, I want to talk about gymnastics, which is obviously the start of the public really getting to know you. You were doing gymnastics, as far as I understand, from a young age, it was a huge part of your life. But when did you decide, okay, I really want to take this all the way and become an Olympian? I feel like I was always that kid that I feel like every kid is. If you ask them what they want to be when they grow up, it's like astronaut or um, president of the United States or comically or... Um, an Olympian. I I feel like for me, I always had that dream as a kid. I wanted to go to the Olympics, but I started gymnastics when I was two, not as a like prodigy of any kind. I was just a wild child that needed an extra activity and I fell in love with it. And I think it was just year after year. I kind of found myself, um, growing this passion that was just, it lit a fire under me. And I think by the time I was in high school, I had kind of tried every other sport and gymnastics was my favorite. And I just kind of decided then I wanted to see how far I could go in it. It was never like um, a serious decision to be like, oh, I'm going to go for the Olympics. It was just kind of this decision of this is my favorite and I want to see how far I can go. So you're training and competing in gymnastics for so many years. You hit high school. You say, okay, I want to take this to the next level. I want to be an Olympian. Like you said, everyone has dreams like that. What was it like to compete in the 2008 Olympics and finally see that through? Um, it was incredible. I, I truly believe it's one of the greatest moments of my life. Um, but I think as an Olympic athlete back in the day, I didn't even realize the magnitude of the situation. One, I was a child. I was 16. And two, naive to really comprehend that magnitude. And then two, um, as an Olympic athlete, an elite athlete, I trained to make sure I didn't um, allow myself to kind of realize how large of a scale the the deal was. And I think it wasn't until um, many years after that I really realized, oh, wow, I, I made it to the Olympics. I won medals. I did a really good job. Um, so to a certain extent, it was it was the greatest moment, but I didn't let myself feel um, how huge of a moment it was just so I could stay focused. Yeah, I've actually heard that a lot. Like you dream of these moments all the time. And then when you're in them, it's just a blur. It's just happening. And you just have to compete and, and do your best. Uh, That said, you did win four medals in your very first Olympics. I believe one of them was a gold. What There had to be some moment of, all right, the dream has been achieved, uh, and maybe I want to do more still, but what is it like to be a teenager and have, you know, a neck full of medals your first time at the Olympics? Um, It's surreal. Um, For me... Again, in gymnastics, I had kind of progressed so much over the years that it was just another competition at the time. But I I distinctly remember after my very last competition day at the Olympics, where I won the gold medal, 
Um, I remember my coach and I looking at each other when the number one came up next to my name on the board, which kind of solidified that I had won that event. And we just kind of giggled to each other. And we were like, I, it was just like this pinch me moment of we're at the Olympics. We've been training together for 12 years and we just won a gold medal. And it was just kind of to see the American flag being lowered and to hear the anthem and to get that medal and just to see all of that. It was truly um, just this moment of satisfaction and understanding that everything I had put into the sport and that challenge that I had or the question I had basically back in the day of how far can I go, I, I kind of had that answer. And it was it was a really cool moment. It was special. You reached the very top at a young age. So um, totally inspiring story. But with all of that experience, all of those accomplishments, now you're in your second act. You have all these projects going on. What is the most valuable lesson that you learned from your time as an athlete, something that you still apply to this day? I think probably the most valuable thing my coach ever taught me is you have to fail before you ever are good at something. I feel like society likes to paint this picture that um, you should only go after the things you're good at. And when you truly find what you're supposed to be doing, it'll just happen naturally. And my coach was a, a firm believer that that is false in every way. And he said, it doesn't matter if you're good at something, you can learn that. The only thing that matters is if you love it. And he taught me from a very, very young age that with any skill in gymnastics, I'm going to fall flat on my face <laughs> and it's probably going to hurt a thousand times before I ever succeed. And I, I think that's a very, very humbling lesson to learn, a very important one, because um, the world likes to tell us it's not cool to fail. And I actually think it is. Now, I know that injury played some role in your decision to retire from gymnastics. And um, if you could take us through what that process was like when you realize, okay, I have achieved my dreams here, but I also have to start thinking about what comes after gymnastics. So what was that like for you? So I think that was the really hard, the hardest part for me was retiring because I was such a young kid. Um, I didn't have the ability to comprehend a life after every single decision I made my entire life up until that moment was based around gymnastics pretty much. Um, what I ate, who I hung out with, when I got my homework done, like all of these small things basically that I dealt with as a kid revolved around gymnastics. After the Olympics, I took a two-year hiatus. I ended up tearing my knee on a ski slope, um, went under a few surgeries and decided that um, to go back into gymnastics. But through kind of that whole process of injuries and comebacks, I, I truly, as a kid, didn't know who I was outside of gymnastics and gymnastics became a fallback. It was the only place I felt like I had an identity and it was this, Oh crap moment of, I didn't have another plan. I didn't plan for anything after gymnastics. And now I have to scramble to figure it out and I might as well go for another Olympics while I, while I try to figure it out in the background. And it was actually um, a month before Olympic trials in 2012 uh, I got hurt again. I was just kind of, my heart wasn't in it. So my body was kind of a reflection. And I decided that I needed to retire and I needed to kind of face this head on and figure out what I want to do with my life. And that scared the absolute, it scared me to death. I, I didn't know if I was capable of being anything else than a gymnast. And I didn't know how to start over. If Raina's thinking about retirement, She'll get some help from Fidelity to envision what's possible and balance risk and reward. And with a clear plan, Raina can enjoy wherever she's headed next. That's the planning effect from Fidelity. You get to a point where you start to make a move into entertainment. You were on Dancing with the Stars. You're on Celebrity Apprentice. How did you make that transition and start making all those TV appearances and showing up in Hollywood? Um, I don't think that's because I really wanted to. I think that more so fell into my lap. I kept ha I kept having all of these opportunities be kind of presented to me, Dancing with the Stars and The Apprentice and uh, whatever it was, just TV appearances. And I didn't know what else to do. So I kept saying yes. And it allowed me to kind of play around and figure out what I liked and what I didn't like. And 
um, meet new people and network and kind of like learn a whole new side of the world that I'd never seen. But I never imagined this would be my life. And you also are a published author. Yes, um, that was never a plan either. But all the way through my training, all the way through the Olympics, I kept a lot of journals and diaries about how I was feeling, what was going on. And um, I feel like as an Olympic athlete, you have this persona of being just a machine, being perfection. And you're always taught to like, don't show your competition, your weak side or your weaknesses, and don't show the world that you're actually human. When I published that book, that was kind of my first move in the second act of showing a more vulnerable side and trying to connect with a world in a different way. And it terrified me. I didn't know how they would respond. Um, but the, the feedback was really good. It kind of proved to me this thought that I had that people don't don't want to just see the perfect side of things. They want to see the real side of things. And I think there's a bigger story there. Yeah, certainly. Um, I think with everything that you're sharing so far, there's a lot that we can all learn from it. I will say, out of all of these things, there's probably millions of people who know you from your YouTube channel, the East family. Uh, you've amassed a lot of views with your husband, Andrew, your whole family. Uh, I know you started out sharing things with books and all these different avenues, but now you have this YouTube channel that is thriving. What has that part of your journey been like? That has been a, a train wreck that has turned into something. I'll, I'll say that. Um, the way that came about. So my husband and I now run an entire media platform, which is crazy. We have about 15 different shows we produce. We consult. We do a lot of different things on the media side. Never imagined that. Completely self-taught. But um, after the Olympics, after doing like that Hollywood circuit, I went on to, to do a bunch of ambassadorships and work with Fortune 500 companies, which was incredible. I got to stand next to Coca-Cola and Nike and all these companies. And I went on to do public speaking. And this um, persona kind of continued of perfection. And I had all of these people telling me what I could wear and how I could act and how I could look and what my political views were and what I could say and not. And... I got so used to being a different person for the world and I finally got so tired of it. And it was actually my husband who started the YouTube channel, not me. I can't take credit for that one. Um, but he was in the NFL at the time kind of bouncing around and he just said, I, I, I'm tired of the same thing. And I think it's time we like maybe document it from our side and actually tell our story. And it was terrifying for me to be vulnerable again, but it slowly kind of took off. And we started to notice that instead of the internet and social media platforms being so one-sided where it's just consumption based and it's just perfect, maybe it could actually be a two-way street where we connect with a world and a community of people who are looking to be relatable and are looking for a community of people to kind of um, surround themselves with. And so we started showcasing our lives and producing content that is wholesome and hopefully makes people feel good and doesn't make them feel alienated by um, societal standards that just don't make any sense. Yeah, I'm noticing that's a big trend on social right now. It seems like you were at the forefront of that. There's been so many years of this perfectly manicured, curated images. And to pull the veil back a bit and show people your real life, um, is tremendous. What is it like to have the business component of this? Things that aren't about necessarily being in front of the camera, getting the gold medal on NBC. Um, but at Front Office Sports, we cover business. So I'm really interested in this part of your path and your second act. And please break it down for us. Yeah. Um, so Side story about my husband. He actually got his MBA from Vanderbilt, and his dream was to go build wells in impoverished countries because he's a civil engineer. Um, he went off and did the NFL and kind of ended up where I am, where both retired and just what weren't sure what to do. Um, and I think that competitive drive that we both had from our sports kind of played into business. And we both just became serial entrepreneurs. We challenged each other and wanted to see what we could do and what would work. And we had all of these random passions, whether it was coffee or kids or kids products or um, 
just truly anything within the lifestyle realm, we said, let's see what we can do and what passions we can kind of um, strive towards and create something from. It all started um, right after, right when my husband and I got married, we kind of ventured into venture capital, um, learned a lot through like investments, and then started creating products, which was really fun. What's something that people don't necessarily know about being on the investment side of the business and something you may not have even realized all those years as an athlete, now that you can look at it from another perspective, what have you learned that surprised you? I would say something that has really surprised me that I've seen over and over and over again. I think I learned that back in gymnastics, just kind of traveling the world and in the Olympic side. But relationships have a lot more to do with it than business, which is interesting. Like at the end of the day, you can have all of all of your spreadsheets and all of your numbers make sense. Um, but it's really the relationships that form companies and businesses and make them succeed. And it's been really cool. Our mission behind Family Made and our, our mission behind SMJ is truly to just spread good in the world and to promote relationships and marriage and families and all the all these good things that we love. And it's cool to see all of these companies that we've been able to invest in, including Angel City, are trying to do the same. And it just kind of restores your faith in humanity that even people who are striving to be very successful businessmen are also striving to be very, very um, big world changers, which I, I really love. Yeah, me too. After hearing about all of this, uh, I'm curious, what is next for you? And also, how does having all of this on your plate compare to all the work that you did to make it to the Olympics and to be a big time gymnast? Um, I would say in a sense, it's crazier. I feel like gymnastics was simpler. Um, training for the Olympics, I had like five things that I knew I needed to do. It was like nutrition, health, mental health, and my physical skills. This, I can't keep anything straight. There's way too many things to do. Um, but I love it. I love the challenge. I love the chase. It's just like another sport. It's just trying to learn the ins and outs and continue to learn and educate ourselves. Um, but what's next? Family Made has been very new for us. And um, we're in a very rapid growth time. We're hiring a lot of people and we're getting ready to publish a lot of new shows and a lot of new content, which we're really excited about that encompasses a lot of uh, new families. Um, but with that, we're getting ready to launch a foundation, which has been a dream of mine forever. We wrote it um, in our journal the other day that our, our dream, um, and I, it, this is going to sound ridiculous to even say, um, our dream is to be able to, to, to raise and donate $100 million within our lifetime. So with our foundation that that starts this year. So we'll see. Well, you've achieved a number of dreams now, so it's certainly not out of reach. What would be your prediction for the next, let's say, 10 years? Do you think you're going to get to that 100 million uh, in that time frame? Do you have anything else that's on your list that you want to check off? Yes, I believe we'll get there because it's for a good cause and we're very, very competitive people. So I, we, my husband and I share the same belief that so many people sacrifice so many things to see our dreams come true that we believe it's our duty now to give that back and to help whoever we can in whatever way because we've been blessed with that platform. And 10 years, sure, I'll take it on. We'll do it. We'll do 100 million donated in 10 years. I, I believe in you after everything you told us today. And in general, <laughs> this has been such an enlightening conversation. I really appreciate you coming out, uh, joining us today on Second Acts and being so open about your entire journey, your career, your ups, your downs. And uh, I think it's really inspiring where this has all ended up. And I look forward to seeing what you're going to do next, where you're going to take it. Well, thank you. So am I. 